Good morning! It is a lovely Tuesday morning, um, and I am here to begin our story time. Um, this is usually our adult story time that I run, um, but today I've decided that we're going to be making this more of a family story time. Um, that way everyone can gather around and listen to our new tale. Um, and today we are going to be reading chapters 1 and 2 of Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. Now this is my 1914 facsimile edition of Alice in Wonderland, so if you are following at home, um, some of the wording might be a little different, but I haven't found too many differences. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, and just so you all know that if you do happen to miss a recording or two, um, we will have these videos archived on our Facebook page um, underneath videos. So you'll be able to go back and listen to the other chapters before you join us um, every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m. <coughs> so without further ado, here is Alice's Adventure in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. All in a golden afternoon, full leisurely we glide, for both our oars and little skill by little arms are plied. While little hands make vain perchance our wanderings to guide, ah, cruel three in such an hour, beneath such dreamy weather, to beg of a tale to a breath too weak to stir the tiniest feather. Yet what can one poor voice avail against three tongues together? Imperious Prima flashes forth her edict to begin it. Her gentle tone, Secunda, hopes there will be nonsense in it, while Tertia interrupts the tale not more than once a minute. Anon, to sudden silence one, a fancy they peruse, a dream child moving through a land of wonders wild and new, and friendly chat with bird or beast and half believe it true. And ever the stormy drain to the wells of fancy dry, and faintly strove the weary one to put the subject by. The rest next time, it is next time, the happy voices cry. Thus grew the tale of Wonderland, thus slowly one by one. Its quaint events were hammered out, and now the tale is done. And home we steer a merry crew beneath the setting sun. Alice, a childish story take, and with gentle hand, Lay it where children's dreams are twined, in the memory of mystic band, like pilgrim's withered wreath of flowers plucked from the far-off land. That, of course, is The Golden Afternoon, the introduction to Alice in Wonderland. <coughs> Chapter 1, Down the Rabbit Hole Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting next to her sister on the bank and having nothing to do. Once or twice she peeped into the book her sister was reading, but it had no pictures or conversation in it. And what is the use of a book, thought Alice, without pictures or conversations? So she was considering in her own mind, as well as she could, for the hot day made her feel very sleepy and stupid, whether the pleasure of making a daisy chain would be worth the trouble of getting up and picking the daisies when suddenly a white rabbit with pink eyes ran close by her. There was nothing so very remarkable in that, nor did Alice think so very much out of the way to hear the rabbit say to itself, Oh dear, oh dear, I shall be too late. And when she thought it over afterwards, it occurred to her that she ought to have wondered at this, but at the time it seemed very quite natural. But when the rabbit actually took out a pocket watch from its waistcoat pocket and looked at it and then hurried on, Alice started to her feet, for it flashed across her mind that she had never before seen a rabbit with either a waistcoat pocket or a watch to take out of it, and, burning with curiosity, she ran across the field after it, and just in time to see it pop down a large rabbit hole under the hedge. In another moment went down Alice after it, never once considering how in the world she was going to get out again. The rabbit hole went straight on like a tunnel for some way and then dipped suddenly down, so suddenly that Alice had not a moment to think about stopping herself before she found herself falling down what seemed to be a very deep well. Either the well was very deep or she fell very slowly, for she had plenty of time as she went down to look about her and to wonder what was going to happen next. 
First she tried to look down and make out what was coming too, but it was too dark to see anything. Then she looked at the sides of the wall and noticed that they were filled with cupboards and bookshelves. Here and there she saw maps and pictures hung upon pegs. She took down a jar from one of the shelves as she passed, and it was labeled orange marmalade. But to her great disappointment, it was empty, and she did not like to drop the jar for fear of killing somebody underneath, so she managed to put it on one of the cupboards as she fell past. Well, thought Alice to herself, after such a fall as this, I shall think nothing of tumbling down the stairs. How brave they'll all think me at home. Why, I wouldn't say anything about it, even if I fell from the top of the house which was very likely true. Down, down, down. Would the fall never come to an end? I wonder how many miles I've fallen by this time, she said aloud. I must be getting somewhere near the center of the earth. Let me think. That would be 4,000 miles down, I think. For you see, Alice had learned several things in her short lessons in the schoolroom and thought it would not be very good, th and thought this would not be a very good opportunity to show off her, skip her knowledge. As there was no one to listen to her, still it was good practice to say it over. Yes, that's about the right distance, but then I wonder about latitude or longitude I've gone to. Alice had not the slightest idea what latitude was, nor longitude either, but she thought they were nice grand words to say. Presently, she began again. I wonder if I shall fall right through the earth. How funny it would seem to come out among the people who walk with their heads downwards. And the antipathies, I think. She was rather glad there was no one listening this time, as she didn't sound that dis it as it didn't sound at all like the right word. But I shall have to come to ask them what the name of their country is, you know. Please, ma'am, is it New Zealand or Australia? And she tried to curtsy as she spoke. Fancy curtsying as you're falling through the air. Do you think you could manage it? And what an ignorant little girl they'll think me for asking. No, it'll never do to ask. Perhaps I shall see it written somewhere. Down, down, down. There was nothing else to do, so Alice began talking again. Dinah will miss me very much tonight, I should think. Dinah was her cat. I hope they'll remember her saucer of milk at tea time. Dinah, my dear, I wish you were down here with me. There are no mice in the air, I'm afraid, but you might catch a bat, and that's very much like a mouse, you know. But do cats eat bats, I wonder? And here Alice began to get rather sleepy and went on saying to herself in a dreamy sort of way, do cats eat bats? Do cats eat bats? And sometimes, do bats eat cats? For, you see, as she couldn't answer either question, it didn't much matter which way she put it. She felt that as she was dozing off and had just began to dream that she was walking hand in hand with Dinah, and she was saying to her very earnestly, Now, Dinah, tell me she came in a heap of sticks and dry leaves and the fall was over. Alice was not a bit hurt, and she jumped up onto her feet in a moment, she looked around, and it was dark overhead. Before she, another, before her was another long passage, and the white rabbit was still in sight, hurrying down. There was not a moment to be lost. Away went Alice like the wind, and just in time to hear it say, as it turned the corner, Oh, my ears and whiskers, how late it's getting! She was very close at, behind it when she turned a corner, but the rabbit was no longer to be seen. She found herself in a long, low hallway, which was lit by row and low, by a row of lit by a row of lamps hanging up from the roof. There were no do there were doors all around the hall, but they were all locked. And when Alice had been all the way down one side and up the other, trying every door, she walked sadly down the middle, wondering how she was ever going to get out again. Suddenly, she came across a three-legged table, all made of solid glass. There was nothing on it but a tiny golden key, and Alice's first idea was this might belong to one of the doors of the hall, but alas, either the locks were too large or the key was too small, but at any rate, it would not open any of them. However, on the second time round, she came upon a low curtain she had not noticed before, and behind it was a little door about 15 inches high. She tried the little golden key in the lock, and to her great delight, it fitted. 
Alice opened the door and found that it led into a small passage, not much more larger than a rat hole. She knelt down and looked along the passage into the loveliest garden you ever saw. How she longed to get out of that dark hallway and wander among the beds of bright flowers, those cool fountains, but she could not even get her head through the doorway. And even if my head would go through, thought poor Alice, it would not, it would be very little use without my shoulders. Oh, how I wish I could just shut up like a telescope. I think I could if I only knew where to begin. For you see, so many of the out of way things had happened lately that Alice had begun to think that very few things indeed were really impossible. There seemed to be no use in waiting by, a little, by the little door, so she went back to the table, half hoping she might find another key on it, or at any rate, a book of rules for shutting people up like telescopes. This time, she found a little bottle on it, which certainly was not here before, Alice said, and tied round the neck of the bottle was paper with the words, Drink Me, beautifully written on it in large letters. It was all very well to say drink me, but wise little Alice knew not going to do was not going to do that in a hurry. No, I will look first, she said, and see whether it is marked poison or not. For she had read several nights little stories about children who had got burnt or eaten up by wild beasts or other unpleasant things, all because they would not remember the simple rules their friends had taught them, such as a red hot poker will burn you if you hold it too long and that if you cut your finger very deeply with a knife, it usually bleeds. And she had never forgotten that if you drink much from a bottle marked poison, it is almost certain to disagree with you sooner or later. However, this bottle was not marked poison, <coughs> so Alice ventured to taste it, and finding it very nice, it had in fact a sort of mixed flavor of cherry tart, custard, pineapple, roast turkey, toffee, and hot butter toast. And she very soonly finished it off. What a curious feeling, said Alice. I must be shutting up like a telescope. And so it was indeed. She was now only 10 inches high and her face brightened up at the thought that she now, that she was now the right size for getting through the little door into the lovely garden. First, however, she waited for a few minutes to see if she was going to shrink any further. She felt a little nervous about this, for it might end, you know, said Alice to herself, and my going out altogether, like a candle. I wonder what it should be like then. And she tried to fancy what a flame of a candle looks like after the candle is blown out, for she could not remember ever having seen such a thing. After a while, finding that nothing more happened, she decided on going into the garden at once. But alas for poor Alice, when she got to the door, she found she had forgotten the little golden key, and she went back to the table for it. She found she could not possibly reach it. She could see it quite plainly through the glass, and she tried her best to climb up on one of the legs of the table, but it was too slippery. And when she tried had tried herself, tired herself out with trying, the poor little thing just sat down and cried. Come on, there's no use in crying like that, Alice said to herself rather sharply. I advise you leave off this minute. She generally gave herself very good advice, though she very seldom followed it. And sometimes she scolded herself so severely as to bring tears to her eyes. And she once remembered trying to box her own ears for having cheated herself at a game of croquet while she was playing against herself. For this curious child was very fond at pretending to be two people. But it's no use now, thought poor Alice, to pretend to be two people. Why, there's hardly enough left of me to make one respectable person. Soon her eyes fell on the little glass box that was lying under the table. She opened it and found in a very small cake which with the words, eat me, were beautifully marked in currants. Well, I'll eat it, said Alice, and if it makes me grow larger, I can reach the key, and if it makes me grow smaller, I can creep under the door. So, either way, I'll have, I will get into the garden, and I don't care which which, and I don't care which happens. She ate a little bit, and anxiously to herself said, which way, which way, holding her hand to the top of her head to feel which way it was growing and she was quite surprised to find that it remained the same size. To be sure, this is what generally happens when one eat cake, eats cake, 
But Alice had gotten so much into the way of expecting nothing but out of the way things to happen that it seemed quite dull for the stupid it seemed quite dull and stupid for life to go on in a common way. So she set to work and very soon finished off the cake. Chapter Two The Pool of Tears Curiouser and curiouser, cried Alice. She was so much surprised that for a moment she quite forgot how to speak good English. Now I am opening up like the largest t telescope that ever was. Goodbye, feet. For she looked down at her feet, and they seemed they were almost out of sight, and they were getting so far off. <clears throat> oh, my poor little feet. I wonder who will put on your shoes and stockings for you now, dears. I'm sure that I shan't be able. I shall be a great deal too far off to, to trouble myself about you. You must manage the best way you can. But I must be kind to them, thought Alice, or perhaps they won't walk the way I want them to. Let me see. I'll give them a new pair of boots every Christmas. And she went on plan planning to herself how she would manage it. They must go by the carrier, she thought, and how funny it will see sending presents to one's own feet and the large and what and the large directions and how odd the directions will look. Alice Right Foot, Esquire, Heart Rug, Near the Fender, with Alice Love. Oh dear, what nonsense I am talking. Just at this moment, her head struck against the roof of the hall. In fact, she was rather more, she was rather more than nine feet high, and she t once took up the, gold, the little golden key and hurried off to the garden. Poor Alice, it was as much as she could do lying down on one side to look through the garden with one eye. But to get through, but as to get, but to get through was more hopeless than ever. She sat down and began to cry again. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, said Alice. You, a great girl like you, she might as well say this, to go on crying this way. Stop at this moment, I tell you. But she went on all the same, shedding gallons of tears until there was a large pool around her, about four inches deep and reaching halfway down the hall. After a time, she heard a little pattering of feet in the distance, and she hastily dried her eyes to see what was coming. It was the white rabbit returning, splendidly dressed with a pair of white kid gloves in one hand and a large fan in the other. He came trotting along in a great hurry, muttering to himself as he came, Oh, the Duchess, the Duchess, oh, won't she be savage if I keep her waiting? Alice felt so desperate that she was ready to ask for help of anyone, so when the rabbit came near her, she began in a slow, timid voice, If you please, sir. The rabbit started violently, dropped the white kid gloves and the fan, and scurried away into the darkness as hard as he could. Alice took up the fan and gloves, and as the hall was very hot, she kept fanning herself all the time while she went on talking. Dear, dear, how queer everything is today. And yesterday things just went on as went on just as usual. I wonder if I've changed in the night. Let me think. Was I the same when I got up this morning? I almost think that I can remember feeling a little different, but it's not the same as the next question. Who in the world am I? And that's the great puzzle. And she began thinking for all the children she knew and were, and were of the same age as herself to see if she could have changed for any of them. I'm not sure, I'm sure I'm not Ada, she said, for her hair goes much, goes in such long ringlets, and mine does not go in ringlets at all. But I'm sure I, I can't be Mabel, for I know all sorts of things, and, oh, she knows such very little. Besides, she, she's she, and I'm I, and, oh dear, how puzzling this all is. I shall try if I know all the things I used to know. Let's see, four times five is 12, and four times six is 13, and four times seven is, oh dear, I shall never get to 20 at this rate. However, the multiplication table does not signify. Let's try geography. London is the capital of Paris, and Paris is the capital of Rome, and Rome, oh no, that's all wrong, I'm certain. I must have been changed for Mabel. 
I'll try and say, how doth the little? She crossed her hands on her lap as if she was saying lessons and began to repeat. It would it repeat, but her voice sounded hoarse and strange and the words did not come out the same as they used to. How doth the little crocodile improve his shining tail and pour the waters of the Nile on every golden scale? How cheerfully he seems to grin, how neatly spreads his claws and welcomes little fishes with gently smiling jaws. I'm sure those are not the right words, said poor Alice, and her eyes filled with tears again, and she went on. I must be Mabel after all, and I shall have to go and live in that pokey little house and have next to no toys to play with and oh, and ever so many lessons to learn. No, I've made up my mind about it. If I am Mabel, I shall stay down here. It'll be no use in putting their heads down and saying, Come up again, dear. I shall only look up at them and say, Who am I then? Tell me that first, and then I I like, and if I like being that person, <coughs> I will come up and stay down. Uh, and I'll, no, if not, I shall stay down here and be somebody else. But, oh dear, cried Alice with a sudden burst of tears. I do wish they would put their heads down. I am so very tired of being all alone down here. As she said this, she looked down at the, her hands and was surprised to see that she had put on one of the rabbit's little, little white kid gloves while she was talking. And how could I have done that, she thought. I must be growing small again. She got up and went and went to the table to measure herself by it and found that, as nearly as she could guess, she was now about two feet high and was going on shrinking rapidly. She soon found out that the cause of this was the fan she was holding and dropped it hastily, just in time to save herself from shrinking away altogether. That was a narrow escape, said Alice in a good deal frightened at the sudden change, but, but was very glad to find herself still in existence. And now for the garden! She ran with all of her speed back to the little door, but at last the little door was shut again and the little golden key was lying on the glass table as before. And things are worse than ever, thought poor, the poor child, for I never was so small as this before, never, and I declare it is too bad that it is. As she said these words, her foot slipped, and in another moment, splash, she was up to her chin in salt water. Her first idea was that she had somewhere fallen into the sea, but in that case, I can go back by railway, she said to herself and Alice had been to the seaside once in her life and had come to the general con conclusion that whenever you go to the English coast, you must find another of bathing machines in the sea, some children digging in the sand with wooden spades and a row of lodging houses and behind them a railway station. However, she had soon made out that it was a pool of tears and that which she had wept when she was nine feet high. I wish I hadn't cried so much said Alice as she swam about trying to find her way out. I shall be punished for it now, I suppose, by being drowned in my own tears. That will be a queer thing to say for sure. However, everything is queer today. Just then, she heard something splashing about in the pool a little way off, and she swam nearer to find out what it was. At first, she thought it must be a walrus or hippopotamus, but then she remembered how small she was, and soon made out that it was only a mouse that had slipped in like herself. Would it be of any use now, thought Alice, to speak to this mouse? Everything is out of the way down here, and I thought I should think that very likely it can talk. At any rate, there's no harm in trying. So she began, Oh, mouse, do you know the way out of this pool? I am very tired of swimming about here. Oh, mouse! Alice thought it must be the right way of speaking to a mouse, she had never done such a thing before, but she remembered having seen in her brother's Latin grammar, a mouse of a mouse to a mouse, a mouse, a oh mouse. The mouse looked at her rather inquisitively and seemed to think and seemed to wink at her with one of its little eyes, but said nothing. Perhaps it doesn't understand English, thought Alice. I dare say it is a French mouse come over with William the Conqueror. For, with her knowledge of history, Alice had a very clear notion how long ago anything had happened. So, she began again. Où est Machette? 
which was the first sentence in her French lesson, lesson book. The mouse gave a sudden leap out of the water and seemed to quiver all over with fright. Oh, I beg your pardon, cried Alice hastily, afraid that she had hurt the poor animal's feelings. I quite forgot that you didn't like cats. Not like cats, cried the mouse in a shrill, passionate voice. Would you like cats if you were me? Well, perhaps not, said Alice in a soothing tone. Don't be angry about it. And yet I wish I could show you our cat Dinah. I think you would let, take a fancy to, our, to cats if you could only see her. She is such a dear, quiet thing. Alice went on half to herself as she swam lazily about the pool. And she sits purring so nicely by the fire, licking her paws and washing her face. And it is such a nice, soft thing to, to nurse. And as such a capital one for catching mice. Oh, I beg your pardon, cried Alice again. For this time the mouse was bristling all over, and she felt quite, felt certain it must really be offended. We won't talk about it any more if you'd rather not. We indeed, cried the mouse, who was trembling all over from end to from the end of his tail. As if I would talk on such a subject. Our family has always hated cats. Blasted, low, vulgar things. Don't let me hear the name again. I won't indeed, said Alice in great hurry to change the subject. Are you, are you fond of, of dogs? And the mouse did not answer, so Alice went on eagerly. There, <coughs> Excuse me. There is such a nice little dog near our home that I'd, I should like to show you. A bright-eyed terrier, you know, with, oh, such long curly brown hair. And it'll fetch things when you throw them. And I'll, it'll sit up and beg for its dinner and all sorts of things. I can't remember half of them. But it belongs to a farmer, you know. And he says it's so useful. It's worth a hundred pounds. He says it can kill all the rats and... Oh, dear, cried Alice in a sorrowful tone. I am afraid I have offended it once again. For the mouse was swimming away from her as hard as she go she as hard as it could go, and making quite a commotion in the pool as it went. So she called down softly after it, Mouse dear, do come back again, and we won't talk about cats or dogs either if you don't like them. When the mouse heard this, it turned around and swam slowly back to her. Its face was quite pale, with passion, Alice thought and said in a low trembling voice and it said in a low trembling voice let us get to the shore and then i will tell you my history and you will understand why i hate cats and dogs it was high time to go for the pool was getting quite crowded with birds and animals that had fallen into it there was a duck and a dodo a lorry and an eaglet and several other curious creatures alice led the way and the whole party swam to shore and that is the end of chapter two. All right, so we finished chapter one and two in this one. So thank you all so much for joining me for our very first virtual story time uh, uh, of reading Alice in Wonderland. We will continue again on Thursday, once again at 9 a.m. So thank you all so much for joining me for um, these first two chapters, and we will see you soon. Bye-bye.